Welcome guys to another one of my videos. Two videos in one day. What? That's true. Now, this isn't a Napoleon video. This is another video that uh, just came out. 14 of October 2021. I want to check it out. It's uh, the history of duels and why the European nobles fought in duels. Now, my uh, overall knowledge when it comes to dueling uh, it's very sparse. I know the Nazis dueled each other, and that's why they had like scars on their faces. A lot of officers had them. Uh, but other than that, I don't know that much about dueling. I know that duel with the guns in the US. You know, there were presidents who would duel each other, which is like hilarious. Uh, but like dueling, I, I wonder if he's gonna. Uh, explain the dueling when it comes to uh, with rapiers, with swords, or is he gonna go more in depth with other weapons? Uh, but that's just uh, European, so I don't know if it's. Anyways, we're getting off topic. I hope you enjoyed this video, and we're, let's learn about dueling. In the year 1386, in front of the Abbey of Saint Martin in Paris, Two iron-cladded knights fought in one of the last judicial duels held in France. Under the eyes of the King of France, the grandest nobles of the realm, and the citizens of Paris, Jean de Carouge and Jacques Legris fought to determine if the latter had raped Marguerite, wife of de Carouge, or if the couple had slandered Legris. The practice of okay. trial by combat or judicial battle is one of the more romanticized customs of yeah, medieval France. Europe with knights fighting to the death for their innocence. But where does it come from, and how did it take place, will be the questions we'll answer in this video. If you're like us and love learning about knights, you've got to watch the documentary called From Knight to Templar, Geoffroy de Champagne from the sponsors of this video, Magellan TV. Mm. A new type of documentary platform, Magellan TV is our favorite place, particularly in medieval Europe. It could occur in a civil or penal trial, where the allegations of the accusers were hard to be proven, or where testimonies could not be trusted or were lacking, and so statements or evidence could not be trusted. To resolve this problem, and to determine if the defendant was guilty, the two sides could agree on a judicial battle, a duel between the two parties that was sanctioned by the judge. The idea was that God would look favorably on whoever was in the right, and would thus favor that party and grant a victory in a duel that would be enough proof for the trial. Makes sense. This is how they generally took place, but of course elements of it could differ in various periods and places. To clear up any confusion, this practice was different from a duel of honor, the classic duel between two men fighting for their honor, or the splendid duel to exercise that took place at tournaments to show off one's strength and valor both of which we'll not cover in this video. The origins of the trial by combat can likely be traced back to Germanic tribal rules, as Roman sources mention that the Germanic people on their borders would often settle disputes with a show of force and arms. We also have testimonies of Goths and Scandinavian peoples partaking in these duels. To strengthen this thesis, no example of this norm can be found in Roman law or in other European, North African, or Middle Eastern legislations Look how from where they might have been influenced. This is not to say that trials by ordeals were exclusive to the old Germanic people. The ordeal, or Oidicium Dei, was a proceeding where a deity was called to manifest its will in a controversial fact and was present in many different cultures. It combined the divine, the moral, and the judicial, which was perceived as indistinguishable at the time. The Germanic people had many other examples of ordeals, such as the ordeals by fire, by heated metal, or by water, where the outcome of the test determined the innocence of a person, but the duel was peculiar to them. The first legal code that mentions the judicial duel is the Lex Burgundianum. The laws had been redacted in the year 501 by Gundabad, King of Burgundy, who was probably influenced by the Visigoths Code of Laws now lost to us. The Burgundian had been an important figure in the last years of the Roman Empire, where he had been a patrician, de facto king, and emperor-maker in Rome. After his father died, he had returned to his people, 
who had settled the lands of modern-day Savoy and ruled them. During his reign, he enacted the customs and law for both his Germanic and Roman subjects, drawing elements from both. The Lex Burgundianum influenced nearly all the other Germanic law codes, and so the judicial duel was codified in the rest of the continent. The Lex Burgundianum influenced nearly all the other Germanic law codes, and so the judicial duel was codified in the rest of the continent. It seems that the purpose of its codification was to speed up trials and to avoid perjury, in a time where the old imperial bureaucracy in Gaul was crumbling, and also to limit the power of the Christian clergy, who had quite a lot of power in the judicial system as it had been based on oaths. The church, in fact, would in all its history have a controversial relationship with the jewels, as they took from elements of the old pagan traditions. But on the other hand, it was also a show of strong faith, and most of the time, jewels were preceded by mass, oaths sworn on relics, and nights spent in church. One of the first recorded examples we have can be found in a testimony of the Frankish chronicler Fredegar. The Lombard queen Gundeberga, daughter of Agilulf and Theodolinda, had married the duke Ariol. I'm not remembering those king. names. During their reign, around the year 624, she refused the advances of the courtier Adelot. To cover himself, knowing that his life was in peril after his reckless attempt, Adelolf went to King Ariold and accused the queen of conspiring against him to remove him and to kill him. Hmm. Ariold believed him and imprisoned his wife in a castle, but an embassy of the Franks came to inquire of the situation and proposed that the truthfulness of the claim be tested in a judicial duel. Hmm. The king accepted and ordered Adelolf to participate, while a certain Piton volunteered for the queen as her champion. In the clash, Adelolf was slain and thus the innocence of Gundeberga was proven, and she was freed after three years of imprisonment. Whoa. In Lombard Italy, the practice would slowly fall out of favour, as the old Did Roman system queen? of testimonies and documents became the preferred method. Imagine your husband is like, you know what, I, you know, a friend of mine just told me that you tried to, you conspired against me, you go to prison for three years. Jesus Since the royal powers preferred this system. However, the conquest of northern Italy by the Franks, and later the Ottonid Saxons, among whom the judicial duel was still very present, consolidated it again in the region. In England, it seems that it was brought in by the Normans, as the Anglo-Saxons had lost the custom. The it was limited in origin only to the free men in society, which with the evolution of feudal society in Europe, meant that only the men who bared arms, the aristocrats, would participate and thus by the 12th century, the nobility had a monopoly over the practice, that had also been sanctioned by the law in many kingdoms. However, the duel became also quite popular among the free city-states of Italy, the Comuni, where richer members of society also partook. How the duel functioned depended on the customs of where and when it took place, but some elements of the duel could include the requirements of the parties to pay for the organization and the staff of the event, while the judges had to be nobles or city consuls. Sometimes the charges that could be disputed in a trial by combat were limited by local laws, and it could require the approval of a judge to take place. In France, it was necessary that the accuser declare that there was no other way to prove the charge and then he had to throw a symbolic object on the ground, often a glove or a gauntlet, that had to be picked up by the opponent to accept the duel. Some places, like Bologna in Italy, hired professional champions that had to duel, where the participant would not know for what they fought. Before the battle, religious ceremonies took place, and oaths were taken, often in front of the king or his representative while the weapons used and the use of horses was decided by the judge. The duels could take more than a day if the participant had the stamina, and outright death during the duel was rare, as one usually lost or surrendered by exiting the fence delimiting the battlegrounds, or by touching the ground with one's head. Mm. By the 12th century, the judicial duel began to fall out in favour of a more robust legal system that characterized the first attempts of centralization of power by the monarchs. 
Emperor Frederick II condemned the duels and limited them to only a few exceptions, such as in the case of death by poison or of Les Majesty, insult of the sovereign. It was also criticized and disciplined by the French kings Louis IX and Philippe IV and by the Castilian king Alfonso X, though not banned as there was still strong popular support for it. It's in the following century that the most scathing critiques of the duels emerged, as the jurists of the newly founded European universities examined them on a basis of Roman and canonical law. The most important work on the subject was the Simula de Pugna by Raffredo Beneventano, where both the juridical side and the customary side were looked at. The opposition on the matter was even stronger in the church, after having been more lenient in the early Middle Ages. Many clerical scholars outright condemned the practice, as did both Pope Nicholas I and Gregory IX, who also forbade clergymen to partake and did not allow men who had participated to be barred from religious functions unless given permission to by the local bishop. I mean, it's very, Their reasoning you know, was that it was an affront to God, who's the best as the parties swordsman? basically yeah. demanded a miracle from God, and if one partook only because he was confident in his martial abilities, then the religious element of the trial lost its meaning. Yeah. One of the last trials by because combat that so took important, place I'm in sure. the Kingdom of France has become the stuff of legends for its protagonist and charges. In the second half of the 14th century, the knight Jean de Carouge and the squire Jacques Legris were vassals to the Count of Perche and Duke of Alençon, Peter of Valois. They had been friends in their youth and were both highly regarded in their liege's household. But as they grew up, Frick... That's a, a dramatic story for a final duel. It's perfect, man. What, like, they were both squires, they were friends, and then someone accused someone of raping his wife. ...action arose between the two. Carouge was jealous of his friend, who was favoured over him at the court in Argentan. Mm -hmm. After the death of his first wife and son, he went to fight in the Hundred Years' War. At his return, he married Marguerite de Thibouville, a daughter of a Norman knight, but more importantly, claimant to estates that had been given to Jacques Legree, exacerbating their relationship even more and losing the favour of his liege. In winter 1386, after having campaigned in Scotland, de Carouge went to Paris to settle some affairs. While he was away, Jacques Legree visited his castle on the 18th of January. It seems that their relationship had improved in the previous year, and since Legree was an important servant of the Duke, he was welcomed by Marguerite. While showing him the castle alone, Legree locked themselves into a room and professed his love for her, mixing promises of gifts and harassments. As Marguerite refused the advances, Legree allegedly raped her. She kept silent until the return of her husband, where she broke and recounted the events. Enraged but not blaming his wife, de Carouge took his adversary to court. But as Duke Peter was the judge of the case, he dismissed the claims against his favourite, as the testimony of a woman was not enough evidence for any conviction. Mm. The couple, who had not attended the trial as they already knew the outcome, appealed to the king in Paris, hoping for a fairer trial. Since the word of a woman was weak evidence for the time, de Carouge challenged Legree to a judicial duel to let God determine who Dude, was in the right. How fucked up it is, man. You become friends with someone, um, and then, what? You, you go to, you wait for your, well, you know, it's not really your friend to rival, but you pretend to be, you know, friends. You wait for him to go to Paris, you go to his castle, and you're like, you know what? Hey, my my friend's wife, wanna show me around? She's like, sure! Nobody, nobody's in the castle, by the way. She's alone. Like, what the fuck? Start showing him around. The guy locks the door. I love you, I love you, please. What the fuck? She's like, eh, I'm not too into it. You know what? I'm gonna rape you. What the fuck? Is that that? Who thinks like that? And then, and then, you know, the husbands come back pissed, of course, and then at least he didn't blame his wife, you know, and then you go to the duke or the count, and the count's like, you know what, uh, I think she's lying, she's a woman, like, let's be honest, and then you go to a king, and then the king's like, hey, it's a woman, and then you're like, you know what, I'm going to throw a gauntlet or a freaking, you know, a glove, and then we're going to have a fight, 
Skinny, this should be a movie. This should be so a movie right now. It's so dramatic. I mean, please. Right. Although this by so the time dramatic. the jewels were you know, rare, from the court in Paris was fascinated by such an occurrence and let the appeal begin in the Parliament of Paris in the summer. Here once again the accusations and the request for a duel were made, with both men and their entourages present. Witnesses were called on both sides, but the court could not reach a final verdict, so the judicial duel was allowed to take place, as both parties accepted it. It would take place on the 29th of December, 1386, after having been postponed for a month so the king could be present. The battleground was set up at the Abbey of saint Martin in Paris, mm. and thousands of Parisian citizens and other people coming from far away attended. Okay, let's make a bet. Who wins? Do we go with the good guy or the bad guy? Hmm. He did say allegedly. So was he doing it for uh, co continuity purposes or did he lose the, the husband? So, you know what, I'm gonna bet on the husband because, you know, good guy here, but we'll see. As an audience, not to mention the king himself, his family and many other nobles of the realm. Both men were fully armed and on horseback and at the given signal, they charged against each other a few times. After an initial blow dealt by Legree's lance to his opponent's thigh, they dismounted and continued the combat on foot. Both excellent men-at-arms, they continued their duel until de Carouge overcame Legree and pinned him to the ground. Kill he asked for his surrender, Get which Legree refused. With his opponent not yielding, de Carouge thrusted his sword through Legree's chest, killing him and winning the judicial duel. He thus obtained vindication for the rape of his wife, who was also risking her life in the duel, as she would have been burnt at the stake if her Whoa. husband lost. Don't... <laughs> That's detailed. How can you just skip over that? Oh, by the way, yeah, she. Uh, if her husband lost, she would have been burnt alive. What? Dude, how fun it is to be born in 2020. Well... To be born in the 19, 20, uh, 19, uh, 20, 21st century. This is insane. You, you accuse someone, your husband has to fight a duel, he loses, you burn alive. The victor approached the king and was rewarded with monetary compensation and a position among the royal guards, where he carried out his duty with distinction until his death in 1396. By the 14th and 15th centuries, the trial by combat definitely lost its prominence. It's hard to pinpoint exactly the last occurrence of a duel, but in England and in Italy, we have our last mentions on the topic in that period, while it survived another century in Scotland and Ireland. Yeah, we have more Scottish videos friend. on medieval history on the way, so make sure you are... So go watch Kings, of, Kings and Generals, amazing channel. Dude, I mean, this should be a movie. This story with um, Le Gris and Le Brun, is it Le Brun? I don't know. The husband and the, the rapist. Uh, it's insane. This should be a movie. It's so dramatic. Friends from childhood. One becomes favorite of the other. One goes to war, 100 years war, comes back, married. The other guy is jealous. Ah, fighting, castle, rape, come back. What? So I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I did. It was an incredible video. Um, Go watch this channel, you know, go uh, give a like, uh, and I'll see you guys in the next video. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. It was insane. I'll see you guys tomorrow.